machines interact like people, and bodies can be rebuilt from scratch. How will we wage war, fuel our need for power, commute to space? How will your life change in fully networked cities of the future? Holographic companions. Hello, Paul. Security systems that recognize you. Cars that drive on their own. See how scientists today are making visions of tomorrow real. Physicist and futurist Michio Kaku will be your guide. The future is closer than you think. It all starts now with the city. In 2057, you will live in a fully wired world. Information will flood the urban landscape. Buildings, cars, streets, and even your clothing will exchange data around the clock. And holographic companions that are only a dream today could make city streets safer. Hey, I'll race you to the hot dog stand. Go! This 3D dolphin is just one example of how smaller, smarter computer chips may merge utility with entertainment. The usual, please. Sure, Paul. Part Playmate and part GPS device, it could guide kids home from anywhere in the city. Hi, Mom. Mm -hmm. Hi, honey. You're home early. How was school? Fine, thanks, Mom. I'll see you tomorrow, honey. Bye, see you tomorrow. And don't spend all your time playing with that silly holofin. I won't, Mom. Taxi. Paul's grandfather was born at the dawn of the Internet, and he's been writing computer code ever since. But after his latest project sparked a fight with his daughter, he's leaving. Asimo packing, not unpacking, you idiot. I said put it in. I need the blowtorch. Hi, Gramps. Hi. Why don't you get the pile of junk and upgrade? This thing's so old, it's got no online connection. I can't get any upgrades anyway. It's probably time to trash it. Here you go. Oh. Please, Grandpa, not again. Sorry, this time I'm going for good. I'm a bad influence, and I'm irresponsible. She happened to catch me putting the finishing touches to your new friend. You know what she says about that? How far have you got with it? It's finished. It's on your desk. You can talk. Yes. Well, come on, show me a few moves. With pleasure. These 3D images are more than just playmates. We will interact with them in hundreds of different ways through medicine, advertisements, video oh. games. Today's TV and computer monitors will seem as ancient to our grandchildren as the horse and buggy. In the future, these 3D images will no longer be confined to a traditional PC screen. Instead, they will leap out. They will jump, they will play, they will fly and float. We will interact with them 24 hours a day. But how close are we to that now? In the beginning, we needed special glasses to view 3D images. Now, a German scientist is creating 3D images we can see with the naked eye. Using special software, Klaus Schenke has created two views of this Egyptian pharaoh. One image is what the left eye would see. The other, a slightly different view the right eye sees. Hundreds of thin vertical lines etched on a piece of glass act as lenses to fuse them. Using this trick, we are able to not wear 3D glasses, but still have a very high quality 3D image. Shanka hopes to make something else obsolete, the computer mouse. In the future, an infrared sensor tracking your finger movements will let you manipulate a computer image that appears 3D. But what will it take to project an image into thin air, like Paul's shark? Researchers at the University of California have invented the first step. Fog screen. 
A screen of water droplets so tiny you can't even feel them. Two jets of air shape the droplets into a thin sheet of vapor. On it, they project an image. Hey, Esmo, can you see me? Uh, could you move a little to the left? To my left? Inventors Tobias Hollerer and Ismo Rakalainen aim to bring true 3D images to life. Well, you look a little like a ghost. I can see it through you. The dream of the computer graphics research community has been for a long time to reach a point where environments can be reproduced so realistically that you think it is reality. The researchers are creating images humans can interact with. The key is a special infrared tracking device the user wears on his head. Okay, we can go ahead and start now. A computer controls an image projected on the fog screen. The computer is also linked to the tracking device. When you move, the computer signals the image to move in response. And the shark seems to follow every move you make. In the future, we will be surrounded by 3D images as real as life. Some scientists believe high-speed laser pulses will let us project 3D images into thin air and even make them appear to move through space. You, Paul? Like Paul's shark. Hey, folks. Celebrate your 100th birthday on the moon. Take your own personal shot. Hey, I got it! One thing that won't change in the future. Kids will still push their curiosity to the limit. Man, how come it always works for Grandpa? Let me out of here, Paul. Please. please oh, I know. Please. Please, Paul, please. Hey, buddy. What's up? I think this is how he does it. Paul is determined to see if he can set his new toy loose in three-dimensional advertisements projected all over the city. Cool. I'm in. In the network city of the future, cars that drive themselves will mean no more accidents. And smart houses will cater to your every need. A computer virus is about to cripple a city. And a police officer is about to find out why. She's on her way to work in a car that drives itself. Networked cars and roadways mean no more traffic jams. Yes? Georgina, where are you? On my way. What's up? We got a problem. A bunch of data control systems have been sending error messages. We're working on it, but when are you going to be here? Computer says six minutes on subterranean drive. Good. See you then. Okay. Wouldn't it be great if you jumped into your car, told it where to go, and the car drove itself without your ever touching the steering wheel? Wouldn't it be great if there were billions of chips stored in the road, each costing a penny, eliminating traffic jams and even car accidents? Now, as ambitious as all this seems, this technology is coming. Most of us drive a car every day without thinking twice. But in fact, piloting two tons of steel and glass through space takes an enormous amount of brain power. And when we drive at high speed, we have to make judgments in microseconds. US alone, nearly 40,000 people die every year in car crashes. New technology will change that. To make an intelligent car, 
engineers around the world are designing braking systems that will take over when humans fail. A radar sensor on the front grille can see the road ahead. The brains are in the trunk. A computer that decides when it's time to step on the brakes. The real test is whether the computer can make split-second decisions like a human. Two cars get ready. One has computerized brakes, one doesn't. Stop. The drivers head at 20 miles per hour right toward two foam walls. Radar senses the obstacle ahead and measures the distance. Then, just yards from a collision, the automatic braking system kicks in Avoiding a crash. Now, automotive engineers want to take the system to the next level by teaching it to predict the driver's behavior. The next the links. If a computer can anticipate drowsiness or distraction, it can override a driver in time to avert an accident. In a simulator, Researchers analyze the driver's every movement. Cameras track which way he looks and the frequency of blinks. Infrequent blinking is a sign of fatigue. They are programming their computers to interpret those signals and predict when the driver is putting himself in danger. Other researchers are taking the driver's hands off the wheel. Robotic cars do all the driving. These engineers are preparing for a race called the DARPA Grand Challenge. Their cars have tens of thousands of line of computer code, and the teams have been staying up late putting the finishing touches on them. Well, for me, since I wrote the software, the biggest fear for me is that something I wrote dies for a silly reason. That is my biggest nightmare. On this testing ground, their challenge is to follow a winding course 130 miles through the desert with no drivers and without remote control. How does a robotic car work? The key is called LADAR. A sophisticated laser system that scans the path in front of the car hundreds of times a second. It relays the data to an onboard computer. Designers must program the computer to respond to every possible scenario. Here, the sensors pick up an obstacle. The computer decodes the data and makes a decision. Then, the GPS system puts the vehicle back on track. Of course, they're still working out the kinks. But in this race, five out of 23 vehicles made it to the finish line. They've blazed the trail for robotic cars. I really think that in the future we could easily have some cars and trucks where the humans don't have to make any decisions, where that all of the human errors and everything like that that causes problems can be avoided. And I think we can get there in the 50 years. In the city of the future, autonomous cars will work safely because the whole city is wired. Every object in offices, homes, and on the streets constantly transmits and receives data. The city is a giant internet where everyone and everything is always online. Everything needed to run the city, police and fire services, power plants, hospitals, is controlled from one central point. The house
house of the future will be part of the same system, wired wall to wall. As soon as you come home, it automatically adjusts lights and temperature to your preferences. Walls, furniture, and appliances all have cameras and microphones that respond to visual and verbal commands. With a word, your favorite program appears on television. When you select a recipe, the fridge checks itself for ingredients and orders missing items from the supermarket. Grocery shopping from your couch. Your intelligent clothing will call an ambulance in case of an emergency. The GPS system will locate free parking slots. Sounds good to me. But you know, all of this comes with a warning. As we become more dependent on technology, just remember, even in the future, computers can crash, technology can fail. Because the urban landscape is so intricately wired, it's also highly vulnerable. Hey, how was it up there? So when a teenager borrowed his grandfather's old laptop to hack his shark into the city's holographic billboards, he didn't realize he was accidentally releasing a virus lurking in the obsolete computer. This modern city no longer has defenses against such an ancient enemy. It's not just computers that are affected, the whole city network begins to crash. In this digital world, the role of the police has widened enormously. Georgina Gator. In 2057, they will patrol a new beat, cyberspace. You need to have a look at this. The train stopped moving 20 minutes ago. Two minutes ago, this happened. A traffic jam. Last time I saw something like that was uh, 20 years ago. I'm looking for the Senior Commissioner for Critical Infrastructures. That's me, Georgina Gator. What can I do for you? Data Security, CityCon. I would have called, but all our lines are crashing. It's a virus in the central CityCon system. Bring up the city on your display. This thing is the problem? Well, kind of. It's attached to a virus, which is scanning the entire city for displays and holograms for the shark to invade. There are millions of them, so it's clogging the whole network. We don't know who the hacker is, but we know how he got in. How? He got access by the internal system of the police department. But how is that possible? In the name of Georgina Gator. Humanoid robots have been promised for a long time. Where do they stand now? And where are they going? Teddy Bear. Have I left anything else? No, I don't think so. Come on, Asimov. Let's go. Ugh. Paul's grandfather is ready to leave with his robot. It's been with him since before Paul was born. Okay. The rust bucket can stay. Just take it to the junkyard when it starts to get near nerves, okay? For years, Hollywood has led us to believe that smart, humanoid robots are just around the corner. Well, maybe it's time for a reality check. Today, after decades of hard work, robots can barely walk across the room without stumbling into the furniture. Being creative, making their own decisions, holding a conversation, these are beyond their capabilities. Now, committed scientists are not giving up. And in fact, they've made a breakthrough in terms of teaching robots how to learn. They say you have to walk before you can run. To scientists at Honda, building their humanoid robot Asimo felt more like crawling. They began in the 1980s with a pair of legs 
Slowly, they added a torso, arms, then a head. But building the body was the least of it. Getting the parts to move in concert like a human took years. What comes naturally to us is, in fact, a complicated balancing act. So the creators of Asimo had to analyze the role of our feet, knees, and hips in maintaining balance. In the year 2000, after countless experiments, Asimo got to his feet. Today, he can walk up ramps, climb up and down stairs, and balance perfectly while performing a thousand movements. But he's hit a wall. Asimo can only do what he's programmed to do. Good morning. How do you feel? I'm feeling great. Thank you. Let's shake hands. Okay. Let's shake hands. Today's robots are programmed for a very specific situation or task. If the situation or environment changes or the context of reaction changes, then these robots are helpless. Go where I am pointing. I'm not sure where you're pointing. Go where I am pointing. Where shall I go? I know you. Pascal. Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Go where I am pointing. I'm not sure where you're pointing. Okay, let's shake hands. What we need are adaptable robots. Robots that can learn through experience. So Asimo must be taught just like a child. Apple. Okay, did you say Apple? Yes, this is correct. Okay. Researchers introduce new objects. Then they test him on what he's learned. Robert Duncan. Okay. In human development, this process takes years. The Honda scientists have figured out how to do it in just days. Unknown object. Teddy bear. Did you say teddy bear? Yes, this is correct. Okay. Please show something. Teddy bear. Yes, this is correct. Recently, the scientists had an even bigger breakthrough. They taught Asimo how to make choices. They want the robot to grab a green bottle. But they haven't programmed a specific way to take it. Instead, they've programmed four options and are leaving the decision up to him. Every five milliseconds, Asimo analyzes the situation and evaluates the options. Then, he picks the most efficient one. It's a milestone for robotic engineering. In the future, you'll depend on robots to cook and clean. They'll even assist surgeons on the operating table. Although advances may be slow, one day you'll wonder how you ever got along without them. Your PC may be assaulted by hackers as many as 50 times a night. Cyber criminals of the future will only get smarter. How are we going to stop them? Paul? Sweetie, put Gramps on the phone. What's wrong? Have you looked out the window today? Mom! The I... Paul, sweetie, he's got to turn himself in. Now get him on the phone. Mom! He left because of your argument. Paul? Mom? Hello? Paul! Everybody, listen up. 
We're initiating a citywide search. This is our man. His name is John Gator, my father. He's one of those old school hackers. He once did eight years in prison for hacking into the medical insurer's database. He nearly wiped it out. Screen on. Screen on. I have to hurry. I don't know how long the secure link will last. This virus is running on 50-year-old code. It has attacked the ancient base layer of the city's operating system. We've got our best people working on it, but I think we should prepare for the worst. Screen off. Since the first virus was introduced in 1983, now we're flooded with 60,000 of them. And in 50 years' time, perhaps a computer virus can paralyze an entire city disrupting food, water, electricity, and transportation, and collapsing the economy. Now, there's always going to be criminals and malicious individuals, so we'll always have computer hackers. There's going to be a never-ending arms race to stop them. At high-tech centers around the country, cybersecurity experts work around the clock to fight online attacks. It's not just viruses they have to deal with. One of the major threats today comes from hackers who break into home PCs and literally take them over. In just a few hours, a determined hacker can gain control of hundreds of thousands of personal computers. If your personal computer is connected to the internet, it can be assaulted up to 50 times a night by intruders attempting to gain control of it. It's pretty easy to break into unprotected computer systems. Dr. Andrew McPherson consults for the Department of Homeland Security. Hackers would use a scanning tool to go onto the network and find computers that show their operating system, show that they're unprotected. And then they would choose appropriate attack tools to break into those computers. And then once they've done that, they would use those computers for any number of purposes. A hacker could launch what's called a bot attack. He programs hundreds of thousands of hijacked computers to send a barrage of messages to one website simultaneously. One example might be before a big game, he might go to a gambling website and shut them down by targeting that gambling website with all of his computers and flooding his gambling computers by requests from all these other computers in his botnet. Then he might try and extort, they might try and extort money from that gambling website saying, hey, if you don't give us this money, we're not turning off this attack. A bot attack can overload a website with 24 gigabytes of data per second. That amount of information is equal to all the books that could fit in the back of a pickup truck. Clearly, unprotected computer networks can't withstand that type of botnet attack when hundreds or even hundreds of thousands of computers are steered against them. Yet a bot attack is the cyber version of jaywalking compared to what may be coming. The real threat that we see is from other nation states who could harness their understanding of the electronic infrastructure. For example, they might cut undersea cables where traffic was, put viruses into command and control systems, disrupt the infrastructure that supports our military. Any cyber threat... More than 20 nations are already developing computer attack programs. And every day, McPherson's team gathers new information on potential threats to America's cybersecurity. In the future, we're going to need a lot more people to protect our infrastructure. We're going to need engineers. We're going to need people like me, researchers. It's always going to be an arms race. The good guys are going to figure out new and creative ways to use information technology for our economy and so forth. And the bad guys are always going to figure out ways to try and circumvent that technology. your shark. Rent, need a help? What? I use your old trick, and then I just attached it to the shark, so we could fly across With the my old virus? Rent, Mom thinks it was you. They're looking for you. 
Gramps, please help me. Paul, you didn't go online using your own computer, did you? Yes. You know, they'll find your data on the system just as soon as they reboot it. Can you fix it? You've crashed the entire network. To fix it, I'd have to access the Central City server. They've got more security than the Pentagon. There's only one thing we can do. Come on. Bank robber or missing person? The city of the future will have intelligent surveillance systems that can track down anyone, anywhere, anytime. Across the city, data networks are collapsing. The entire city is shut down. We need to seal up all the... Only a few key sectors still function thanks to separate networks that keep them virus-free. Find, find him now. Bring him into custody. Police are using thousands of surveillance cameras to search for the hacker. Uh, a mixture of satellite and terrestrial cameras okay? Okay. Start with the outskirts. And go. Nations around the world are installing millions of surveillance cameras to protect their citizens. And Great Britain is leading the way with 4.2 million surveillance cameras that can photograph each citizen 300 times a day. Now, that may sound excessive, but public acceptance rises every time they capture a terrorist or a child abductor. Now, these cameras have limitations. They can basically record, but they cannot identify. That's why computer scientists are now building the next generation of intelligent camera surveillance systems. London's hundreds of thousands of surveillance cameras paid off in the summer of 2005 when video footage helped police track down terrorists who had bombed city buses. But even the world's best system has a blind spot. Each camera acts alone. There's no way to track a subject when he moves out of the range of one camera and into the range of another. So, Dr. Dimitrios Macris and his team at Kingston University are developing a computerized network of cameras that talk to each other. Okay, can you see the cameras? They are around. Okay, okay. The software is designed to predict the path of a suspect, then alert the rest of the system to his probable course. You can see here how the person is being tracked by our software. The red box shows where the person is currently located. The black box shows where the person will soon be. Okay, James, can you start it now? Thank you. Macris tests the system. You can go now. The subject is tracked by camera one. He walks out of view. But thanks to the computer program, camera two finds him, and then camera three. The cameras are talking to each other. That's just the beginning. Now, let's up the ante. What if the cameras could not just track him, but identify him and pick him out of a data bank? Henning Daum and his team are on the verge of making this possible with an ingenious face recognition system. With regular 2D images like these, the actual identification of a person is nearly impossible. Let's take this image as an example. The person is looking down and is lit from the side. In this picture, the same person is looking up and lit more strongly. It's very difficult to identify a person on the basis of these two images as the same one. We need a new technique. Yeah, Don starts with a conventional headshot. 
Then, he projects horizontal lines onto the face for a third of a second. The shape of the head distorts the line pattern. And the computer uses the distortion to construct a virtual plaster cast, a 3D likeness. Once the likeness is entered into a database, the subject can be identified, regardless of camera angle or lighting conditions. So what's the trick? Instead of using a normal 2D image like this one, we use the distance from the camera to create our own image of the face based on depth, much like a 3D mask. Then, if we have an existing mask of her face stored in our database, we compare the two by placing one into the other. 50 years from now, facial scanning may be perfected. But by then, surveillance cameras won't be the only game in town. We'll also have smaller, more sophisticated technologies called biometrics that identify people by their unique physical characteristics. The most familiar form is fingerprinting. It's been around for over a hundred years. But newer technologies promise far more secure and sophisticated methods to identify people. Iris scanning, voice recognition, skin scans, instant DNA testing. 50 years from now, between intelligent surveillance cameras and biometric identification, fugitives will have no place to hide. Bingo! Below Drive, Commissioner. Heading north. Where's he going? Can you make a prediction? System program predicts. Destination is... Hall! Oh. Municipal Archives. The police have a fix on the suspects. It's a race against time to peel back the city's digital history and find where the virus is hiding. Put your hands up in the air and get away from the computer, John! Paul and his grandfather hope the city archives will help them track down an ancient computer virus. Every detail of the city's history is stored here. Computers have crashed. No kidding. What is going on? I need the data from the old city administration. What data? Do the original maps still exist? Come with me. How many CDs do you have containing music and video? Well, I hate to tell you this, but in the future, much of that information could become unreadable because your computer is obsolete. Now, if you think you have lots of important data, just think of the national archives and libraries of the world. Now, there is a solution to the problem. Holographic crystals can store up to 200 DVDs worth of information for a thousand years, either as digits or as microscopic images. This means that you could read the data even without a computer. There you are. There it is. I know it. Is that the main computer glimpse? Not quite, my boy, not quite. We'd never get in there, but this is the next best thing. Dad, oh, do no. you have any idea what you've done? I'm going to lose my job, and you're going back to jail. Yeah, but Mom, I... it was me. Gramps had nothing to do with it. Oh, you just stay out. No, Mom, it's true. But Gramps can fix it. We have to manipulate the main computer. Paul's identification data is still on it. I'm hoping to get access using a little detour. You mean to tell me that a 13-year-old boy did this? Well, he did use my technology. Okay, go. What do you want me to do? Keep him here. Stall him. How much time do you need? 20 minutes. Go, go. Go, 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 go. 
Where is he? I don't know. I must have just missed him. The entrance has to be around here somewhere. Here, that's it. It has to be. It's locked. Shoot. They found the city's old communication headquarters. When the city built the new one, they closed this one down. But it's still connected to the central computer. That's where he's going. It's close. Come on, let's go. Keep going. Now, if they can get direct access to the city's operating system, they can hack into the network, find the virus, and destroy it. Okay, just let me do it. Slash. Okay, Paul, you're safe. I erased your identification data. Okay, now what? You have to go to the inner core program. Yeah, that's good. If the electricity goes, that's it. Don't stop him. He's trying to save the power. Say it one more time, Don't son. Get away from the computer. I'm the one who messed everything Don't up. Don't try to protect him, son. It's too late, system. Paul! Come here, now. John, this what? is my last morning. Look, Dad, I know you tried. I don't get it, Georgie. It should have worked. Hey, I look know. over there! Release him. He's not our guy. Paul Edward Gator. Get over here. No more sharks. Stick to dolphins. How will demands for energy change our future? New fuel sources, elevators into space, invisible soldiers. See your world 50 years in the future. 2057 continues next with... The world. Want to experience city life in 50 years? Or hear more from futurist Michio Kaku? Get into the future zone at discovery.com slash 2057. Interact with tomorrow.